Why did sabres become almost the universal preferred type of military sword across the world in the 19th century? Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiator and Eastern Antique Arms Limited as well. Now this question comes from my patron, John Rennick. So over on Patreon, um, I've got a, uh, a whole bunch of patrons on there and they ask some really, really cool questions. And in fact, I've got a pinned uh, kind of like questions list for future videos. And every now and again, I dip into that. Um, and this question comes from John uh, Rennick. So thank you so much, John, for this question. It's a very good question. It's potentially also a vast and huge question. So I am honestly, even, you know, for me, I know this is this is a long stretch, but I'm gonna try and be as concise as possible. So why did sabers become pretty much the universal, uh, most popular type of military sword in the 19th century? Well, before we try and answer that question, first of all, you wish to say, is that true? Is it the case that sabers, what do we mean by saber? Basically, a uh, with a half, what's called a half basket hilt like this, a, uh, for the most part, a cut, cut and thrust blade. Some of them had slightly more specialized thrusting blades. Uh, one handed sword. Um, is it true that they became the predominant type of swords across the world uh, in sort of modern militaries, so should we say? Uh, and the answer is yes, pretty much. Obviously, there were some exceptions. I know some people, particularly you spadrooners out there, are going to be yelling at the screen, what about the spadroon? Because spadroons were still around um, in various forms, and some people would argue that some of what we might call sabres, the blades made them types of spadroons. But spadroons uh, with the more small swordish type hilt were still around for most of the 19th century, so they were still around. And equally, hangers or uh, you know shorter versions of sabres were around as well, carried by pioneers and artillery and things like this as well. But it has to be said that for the majority of nations in Europe, North America, and all over the world really, officers, for the most part, carried a form of sabre and uh, cavalry pretty much all carried sabres. Really until the end of the 19th century, and when we get to the end of the 19th century, we start to see more straight, almost S-Doc type bladed swords becoming popular. One of the first ones, well, I mean, you've got the French cuirassier um, sword, which is essentially a palash, which means a straight single-edged um, uh, sword, although it's very thrust-centric and a palash could be seen as a cut and thrust sword. But the cuirassier sword was quite specific. And certain other nations copied the French cuirassier sword, uh, the Russians, the Prussians at a certain point, and so on and so forth. And then towards the end of the 19th century, you find that cavalry are really, they drink the Kool-Aid on the whole thrusting mentality, uh, essentially using the sword more like a short lance. And we start to see, you know, with the Swedish 1893, the British 1908, um, the American 1913, and various others. So we do start to see more specialization towards thrusting swords at the end of the 19th century. But, to keep it relatively concise, for most of the 19th century, and in some cases all the way into the 20th century, what we'd approximately call sabres were the predominant cavalry swords and the predominant infantry officer swords and also carried by people like um, artillery officers and uh, very often gunners um, and we can relate this also to the cutlass as well which was carried on board ships which is essentially a shorter slightly broader version of the sabre so Yes, it is true to say that more or less sabres dominated the 19th century. And related to that, I would also say how are we defining what a sabre is for the purposes of this question? Well, it's got a half basket hilt and it has a predominantly single edged blade. Obviously there are double edged versions, but they, they are not so common. A single edged blade and it has cut and thrust capacity and they vary in curvature. Some of them are straight, some of them are, most of them are slightly curved and some of them are very curved. And John Rennick also specifically specifically asked why the sabre as opposed to rapiers or long swords or small swords or various other types of swords that have been predominant through history. So here are my answers. First of all, let's consider the hilt. Well, the hilt is what's called a half basket and that is to differentiate it from a full basket. So a full basket hilt protects the sides as well as the front. A sabre predominantly only protects the front. And not all sabres have a half basket. Some of them have what we call a three bar hilt. But actually, if you look at the silhouette of the three bars, whilst we've got uh, holes here which makes the hilt overall lighter um, we do cover the same amount of the hand more or less 
as the half basket hilt. It's just that you've got those gaps in between. But in terms of defending against cuts, the three bar hilt offers pretty much the same amount of um, protection. Uh, and we shouldn't uh, forget to mention, of course, the simple knuckle bow. Now, simple knuckle bows uh, were used on some of the earliest infantry officers' sabers, and indeed they were used on uh, light cavalry swords. And in fact, we still find them on certain sabers all the way through into the 20th century, things like Polish sabers uh, and uh, Central and Eastern European sabers, they particularly like one type of knuckle bow. This is partially related to the fencing style um, and other things as well, how you want the sword to perform. But overall, we can say loosely, they all have, to varying degrees, hand protection, which is clearly a good thing if you're holding the sword out in front of you and fencing with it, um, and you've invented hand protection and hand protection is an option. But note that these are all substantially lighter in the hilt and more convenient to wear than something like a full basket hilt, which is much bigger, bulkier, heavier, takes up more space and is a bit of a pain in the butt to wear. Now, in terms of one-handed or two-handed, because John specifically asked why didn't officers, for example, in the 19th century carry long swords, Quite simply, they, long swords are a bit of a nuisance to carry, them having long hilts. Even if you only have a blade that's the same length as a one-handed sword, if you have a longer blade, then that makes it even more of a pain to carry. But with a longer hilt, it's much more inconvenient. And you've got to remember that this is the age of firearms. So an officer's equipment at this time for most of the 19th century would be a gun. Let's just grab a gun. Here we go. Uh, so this is an Adams Mark II revolver. So they'd have a gun in one hand, a, a pistol of some kind, and a sword in the other. Usually this way around, usually the dominant hand would have the sword because then you can defend yourself and parry. In some situations, um, if someone comes flying in at you with a, uh, you know, a bayonet, for example, you can parry the bayonet, blow the guy's head off, or uh, parry a sword cut, blow the guy's head off, <laughs> or whatever. Or you can bam, 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 you can shoot six of the enemy and then go charging in with your sword. So it gives you a very, very versatile set. And of course, remember that very often officers, or even infantry officers are gonna be riding on horseback, and cavalry are all on horseback. So a one-handed sword is much more appropriate than a two-handed sword. Two-handed swords, more associated with people fighting on foot, um, in the age of armor and this kind of stuff. Uh, so just not really appropriate or not so appropriate for this period. A one-handed sword makes much more sense, especially if you need your left hand for things and just generally for wearing and carrying around. Now, an absolutely amazing sword from history that I'm sure lots of officers would have liked to have carry if they'd had one available would have been a rapier. So rapiers have thrust-centric blades. So so long as you're gonna poke people with the pointy end, uh, they give you a massive reach advantage and they can still cut. They're not as powerful cutters as most sabers are. At least most rapiers are not as powerful cutting as most sabers are. There's a variation in sabers and variation in rapiers. Um, but they have a huge reach advantage, very good for thrusting, and they have a lot of hand protection. However, my belief is that these wouldn't have been popular overall in the 19th century because they are really, really long. And if we go back to the Elizabethan period, you know, 16th, 17th centuries, then we find actually that even in the age of the rapier, lots of people were carrying rapiers with not particularly long blades. So while you can find some with immensely long, you know, 50 inch blades, you can equally find lots of rapiers only with 35 inch blades, not particularly, only a little bit longer than a saber. And that's probably partly because number one, it's a pain to carry, wear such a long blade around. It just gets in the way of everything. Two, it also uh, takes longer to draw. The longer the blade is, the longer it takes to get out when you're in a pinch. And thirdly, if you're fighting any kind of melee or um, in buildings or trenches or any kind of confined environment, such a long blade starts to become disadvantageous. So in a one-on-one -on -one duel in an open space, yeah, the longest weapon you can get up to a point is advantageous. However, in any kind of, you know, scrum or, or kind of close-in situation, actually, it becomes a disadvantage. It becomes unwieldy. A perfect example is how a spear in a melee, it might be better to drop it and pull your sword out because in that particular scenario, the sword will become more useful than the spear. So, firstly, the blade size and length, uh, not very great for either wearing or, or just general use for most situations, but also the hilt. So, these hilts are fantastic protection, but they've got all sorts of things to get stuck on clothes or 
um, just be a nuisance when you're wearing them. And actually, if you look at a sabre hilt, it is a much tidier thing and it offers pretty much as, uh, maybe not quite as much hand protection as a rapier, but in some ways I would say it offers about the same, but is just a simpler shape. It's simpler to make, it's a simpler solution, it's got smooth edges, nothing to get caught, uh, things bump off it and it's just absolutely fine, nothing's going to get stuck. So I think that this is, this is a later hilt design, but I think it, in many ways, for practical purposes, it's a more effective and a more efficient hilt design. Now, some people would ask, why not the small sword? This developed uh, ultimately from the uh, rapier in the 17th century, middle of the 17th century, small swords start to evolve. There's a transitional rapier in the middle, which is uh, like a lighter version, a lighter, smaller version of the rapier, and that becomes eventually the small sword, the French small sword. Uh, the rapier was a sort of Spanish and Italian, um, invention you could say um, and the small sword was more or less a French invention. Now these are definitely more convenient to carry they have the blade length about the same as a sabre but they are utterly specialized to the thrust and they're really a dueling sword so these are for two gentlemen to settle a matter of honor over. One of the reasons now they were carried as military swords first of all so when officers started appearing on uh, battlefields distinctively dressed from their men and wearing the badges of office of being a gentleman, they would wear a gentleman's sword. So in, should we say, the early to mid 1700s, it was absolutely common for officers to wear small swords. There was a period in which they wore small swords. And in fact, uh, even people like George Washington wore small swords, although he also wore a sabre at a different time as well. Um, but even late in the 1700s, people were still sometimes wearing small swords in war. That being said, it seems to be the case that throughout the 18th century, it would started to be found that officers found these insufficient as weapons of war. And lots of gentlemen might wear one of these in civilian life, but they would wear one of these in military life. And the simple fact is, war is rough and tough, and um, you're gonna be facing things like pikes and bayonets and horsemen's swords, heavier horsemen's swords, palaches, sabers, and back swords. And a small sword is really quite puny against those. So trying to parry a musket with a bayonet on it, which weighs about 10 pounds, with a weapon that only weighs about 400 grams, is really difficult. So yes, they're really quick. Yes, they're really nimble. Yes, you can stab people with them. So they're still useful as weapons. But overall, I think that what happened is a lot of people took these to war and thought, oh, I want something a little bit stronger. Like when that horseman's bearing down at you, swinging a broadsword at your head, trying to parry a, a cavalry cut with a small sword would be an absolute nightmare. <laughs> so what basically happened is, first of all, the spadroon was invented. So the spadroon is essentially a, a hybrid uh, between a, a backsword, a broadsword, and a small sword. So they kept a small sword-ish style hilt and married it to a cut and thrust more robust blade. But basically what happened by the Napoleonic Wars, lots of infantry officers even found spadroons in insufficient and were switching to sabres. So that, by the time we get into the 19th century, after the Battle of Waterloo, so many infantry, sab so infantry officers were carrying sabres that they became, pretty much in every country, sabres became the standard uh, sidearm for infantry officers. And they already were, of course, for the cavalry, because the cavalry were already using sabres in abundance. And in many cases, infantry officers went, oh, I'm not that keen on this spadroon I've got. I think I'll have one of those cavalry sabres, please. Uh, because in a rough and tough uh, fight on the field of Waterloo or anywhere else, Austerlitz or wherever, um, a weapon like this, you might find it more useful as a weapon of defence and offence. And remember, infantry officers are often just defending themselves. So if someone's stabbing at you with a bayonet, often something like this will be a better thing to defend yourself with being more weighty and robust than a spadroon or a small sword. Um, so, uh, to cut a long story short, the, the, the small sword, I think, although it had a period of vogue in which it was carried as a military sword, useless as a cavalry sword, incidentally, it's just not strong enough, just too fragile. Um, 
it did pass out of favour, first of all in favour of Spadroons and then ultimately in favour of Sabres. So contrasting Sabres with small swords, rapiers, long swords, that's just three uh, swords from history. Obviously I could pick others. Um, another one actually a lot of people will ask about is why didn't people continue carrying something like a, a Langmesser or a Falchion? Well in many ways they did, so notice that certain soldiers, naval uh, sailors carried cutlasses, and um, gunners often carried hangers, pioneers, uh, so sappers and royal engineers um, often carried uh, a form of short sword. So they, short swords were around and, and for a large part they're essentially a short sabre. Why did they go for a shorter one? Because it's easier to carry, more useful in the environments they're going to be fighting in, for example sailors on board ship. But it is essentially just a shortened sabre. Now you could say why didn't everyone carry a shortened sabre? because of reach advantage. Quite simply, if someone has got, if you are using a hanger in an open field and you come up against someone with a sabre in an open field, the person with 10 inches more reach is gonna have a reach advantage, surprise, surprise. So they're always gonna be able to stab or chop you from a distance where you can't yet reach them. Okay, so reach advantage. So it's always weighing up how much do I need this to be convenient or useful in a tight space, like on board ship or in a trench, or how much do I need a reach advantage in an open field or from horseback? Um, so I think by and large, that's why hangers did stay around because they're great weapons. They are ultimately just short sabers, um, but they were not as widely used as longer bladed sabers for the aforementioned reasons. Now, the final thing I'm gonna look at for why sabers um, were so popular in the 19th century as military swords all over the world is to do with the particular blade shape. First of all, we've got the fact that it is a cut and thrust sword. So, it's most sabers, uh, not all of them, but most sabers have the ability to both cut and thrust, which gives you lots of options, which is great. We won't go any more deeply into it than that. Secondly, a slight curvature. Now I've mentioned that most military sabers in the 19th century were what I would call slightly curved. Even this one here with the 1796 style hilt, this is the Osborne and Gumby variant, this is slightly curved. That means you have some of the advantages of a curve and some of the advantages of being almost straight. If you make a blade very, very curved, yes, it will be better for certain types of cutting actions. However, overall, it will be worse for thrusting. If you make a blade completely straight, it loses some of the small advantages that you have from having a slightly curved blade, and I'll talk about those in a second, um, at the advantage of giving it a slightly more effective thrust because it's in a direct straight line. Now, what is the slight advantage of having a slight curve to a blade? Very simply, it helps with edge alignment and it helps with tracking to, to the target. And believe it or not, it, as far as I'm concerned, it also helps slightly with sharpening the blade. I find slightly curved blades easier to sharpen. But overall, a slight curvature does seem to aid cutting. And part of that is to do with edge alignment, if not actually once you've kind of, if you did things with a machine, you might find a straight blade might perform as well as a curved blade. But in reality, with people actually holding these weapons, curved blades do seem to uh, do seem to track through targets better more of the time. And I have talked about that in previous videos, so I won't go into more depth um, here. The final issue to talk about the blades and why sabers were so popular in the 19th century is the fact that they are predominantly single-edged. Well, throughout history, um, I've got a sax here, and I'll be talking more about this sax in future videos. Throughout history, single-edged blades have been easier and cheaper and quicker to make than double-edged blades, um, number one. Okay, so economically it makes sense to make a single-edged blade because you've only got one bevel to put on. Secondly, it means that you can have a more shallow edge bevel or edge angle and have all of the strength at the back instead of trying to put the strength in the middle like with a double-edged blade and therefore having to have a broader cutting edge angle. So it means that you can get a thinner, finer edge with all of the strength located at the back where you don't need to have an edge. And perhaps um, associated with that point, we can also say it means you can have the fullers, the, the grooves, the weight removing grooves towards the back of the edge instead of trying to squeeze them in the middle, which means you can make a very light blade that's still very strong and stiff. And additionally, we could also add to this, the subject of maintenance perhaps, because a double-edged blade, you know, maintaining edges when they're in constantly going in and out of scabbards and being used, 
If you've only got one primary edge to maintain, that is a lot less than having two primary edges to maintain. And also, incidentally, it means when you put the sword into the scabbard, you can push towards the blunt back edge, keeping the sharp edge away from the lip of the scabbard. Um, much like how a katana, for example, is worn edge upwards, a sax is worn edge upwards, and so on and so forth. Whereas when you have two edges, both edges are going to collide with that scabbard repeatedly. So, John, thank you so much for your question. I hope this has been interesting for the watchers. I have, I think I've covered an awful lot of points relatively concisely by Matt Easton standards. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I've got lots more like it on the channel. If you want to find out more about sabers, then just search for the word saber, spelt the British way with R-E at the end for the most part. Um, and you'll find loads of videos about sabers on my channel. Um, and also thanks again to my patrons who make me running this channel possible and John especially um, You've won the prize for um, a patron of the day uh, because your question has now been answered Thanks a lot for watching and I hope I'll see you back on the channel soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching We've got extra videos on patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks <laughs>